scripture, um, it was, to me, I think it was just so appropriate that it's um, kind of the holidays are upon us. And I know that we're here having so much fun and enjoying fellowship and, and just being able to be together. But um, as we have Thanksgiving on Thursday and, and Christmas is on the heels of that, um, we're actually going to be around a lot of people that maybe aren't as fun. <laughs> you know, and I was thinking that I thought, I hope that doesn't sound mean, but we all have family members that we don't necessarily get along with. And, and for all, and maybe some of you have, you know, your family's perfect and everything's great. You might want to tune me out for the next 20 minutes. Um, but I was thinking of, you know, how we're going to be stepping out and, and meeting with those people that um, maybe don't love us for our faith like we all love each other in this room and that uh, maybe don't appreciate our faith um, the way we wish they did. And um, for me, when I was looking at this scripture, it just kept speaking to me that, that we are Christ's examples. Um, we are his examples here, and, and what are those people in the room that we're going to be eating Thanksgiving dinner across from, what are they thinking about us? And, and is our example one that they can look at and think, wow, she's different? Or do we blend in a little bit too much? And I think, Peter, the whole book of, of 1 Peter, it's, it's really this encouragement of how to live godly lives in a hostile world. Mm -hmm. And it made me think that sometimes, you know, even sitting at the Thanksgiving table can be a little hostile. You know, it can be, you know, a little bit challenging. And, and how do we step up for the Lord? And how are we to act in those circumstances? Um, it's our unsaved family members that our lives need to speak to. And that just, God just pressed that on my heart so much this week. Um, we need to realize that... You know, we think of uh, evangelism. We were talking the other day that um, oh, who has the gift of evangelism and who doesn't. And you picture evangelizing as being out on the street corners and, and passing out tracts at the beach. That's where people used to pass me tracts, I remember. And that that's what evangelism is. But really, if you look at it, we are evangelizing with our lives what the gospel we believe to be true every single day. And are people looking at our lives and thinking, oh, yeah, they must be. Christians, you know, I want to be like that, and, you know, I think we often don't think of our lives as being, you know, that example that it really should be, it, it's, it's an important job that we represent Christ the way that we do, it's huge, we are his hands and feet, um, and sometimes I just think we need to ask ourselves, like, are we reflecting Christ in the way that we should be, and when I was looking through this section of scripture, um, it just kind of spoke to me. There were three different areas that I think that our example, um, we can really work on uh, abstaining. That's in verse 11. It talks about abstaining from fleshly lusts. And then we go into uh, verse 13. It talks about submitting for the Lord's sake. And then in, in verse 23, it talks about committing. He committed himself uh, to the one who judges justly, and do we commit? So those are going to be the key points that I that I want to focus on: abstaining, submitting, and committing. And are we doing those things? And does our lives and our walk reflect that? Um, before we're gonna we're gonna look mostly from verses 11 on to probably verse 23. That's where we're gonna focus. But I just couldn't even share the heart of this message without at least going through verse 1, because it's just a staple. We need to understand who we are in Christ, and and Peter um, is talking to what's believed to be a lot of new converts that are being um, persecuted, and it's, just, it's it's newer to them. They're just newly saved, and and they're, they're wondering, how do I live? How do I grow spiritually in this environment? And so God is very faithful through Peter to show us how to do that, and it says in verse 1, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Mm -hmm. Our first response to tasting how gracious the Lord is would be desiring the pure milk of the word. And it's, it's laying aside those things, um, 
that bind us from receiving God's word, that bind us, you know, from, from drawing closer to the Lord, that set, um, sin separates us from God, and we need to understand that. We need to lay aside everything that would hinder uh, the new life that we have in Christ. And we need to desire everything that would promote spiritual growth. And, and how do we do that? And it says that the word um, is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. God's word is living. His spirit is living in us. And we need to know we have the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. And we need to be sensitive to that and aware of that. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, uh, or 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed and useful for the teaching, rebuking, and correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's what his word does for us. His word equips us, it trains us, it teaches us, it rebukes us. And in order to know God, we need to know his word. It, 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 there's no knowing him without his word. And I love the example of, of a baby you know, and desiring that milk of the word. And you think of the baby, how they have that rooting instinct. You know, when a baby's hungry, my niece is three months old, and, and when she starts rooting, I'm looking for mom because I can't help <laughs> at all. And so they have this just natural instinct to root. You don't have to tell a baby to know what to do when it's hungry. You know, it'll start rooting. And I think spiritually, as Christians, like, do we root to the word when, when we're hungry, when we're thirsty, when, when we're... Um, depressed, whatever it is, are we rooting to the word of God? Because this is our only answer. This is really all we need. I learned so much this I learned things I didn't even want to learn. I really did. Like things I was like, I'm good God. He's like, you're not that good. I thought, wow, I'm really not. Um, I'm actually going to gonna read from um, the NIV um, verses 11 through 23 where we're studying because for me um, uh Peter can be a little bit wordy, and the NIV um, really makes it practical. I mean, it just speaks right to our heart, and it speaks so clearly that I thought, you know what, I like, I'm going to read it in the NIV. So, um, verse 11 and 12 says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world, and, and Peter's referring to us as being pilgrims and scattered. I know we know that already, but it says, and this is the first point, to abstain from sinful desires which war against the soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. That's huge. That we are to abstain from fleshly desires because they war against our soul. And do we get that picture, that visual picture that, that when we're dabbling in sin and that when we're maybe... Um, not abstaining, but kind of moderating our sin and maybe allowing some things to be there, but not completely in it, eliminating it, you know, because we don't want to be legalistic. You know, are we are we toying with those things? Are we um, allowing those sins to separate us from the Lord? And are we um, having one foot in and one foot out? That's what I always think. When you're living that life, one foot in, one foot out, you're never going to have peace. That's just all there is to it. You cannot have the peace of the Lord and living your life one foot in and one foot out. Verse 13 says, um, Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the kings as the supreme authority um, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong or commend those who do right. For it is uh, God's will that by doing good you silence the talk of ignorant um, of ignorant men and of foolish men. That's that's the the will of God is that we would do good and that would silence the foolish talk of ignorant men. You know, it's our lives, it's our it's everything we do. And it says that we're submitting, which is the second point. It's submitting for the Lord's sake. Sometimes submitting, well, most of the time submitting doesn't really feel good because when you submit, it's because you don't necessarily agree is one of the reasons you're submitting is because otherwise you just all be on board together, you know? So part of submitting, but when you think of it as submitting for the Lord's sake, it, it, it brings that honor to God. It's that picture of God submitted to the cross. Jesus submitted all the way to the cross. And think of what he went through and, and, and what he was going through, yet he submitted completely to the Father, what he had told him to do. It's God's will that by our behavior, our walk, our witness, 
that we should be, it should be so evident, so constant, and so authentic that it would silence our biggest critics. And who are our biggest critics? The unbelievers, right? Most of the time that's our biggest, sometimes it's other Christians, but the unbelievers. And we need to think, who are the unbelievers in our life, right? You know, are we, sometimes when we deal with unbelievers, you know, and they'll think, oh, all, all Christians are hypocrites. It's like our behavior actually adds fuel to their fire. And do we think of it like that? Like we're just adding fuel to the fire by certain things that we do. Um, it says in verse 16, live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. And yes, we have liberties in Christ, but those liberties are not a license to sin. Galatians 5.13 said, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only um, do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. And I think sometimes we do that. Sometimes we think, you know, that's just our opportunity to still have that area because we have our liberties in Christ. And in verse 17 it says, Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers, fear God, and honor the king. And I think what showing proper respect to everyone, you, that's hard to do sometimes because some people you just don't like. And some people just rub you the wrong way or some people wrong you. How many of us have had somebody that's wronged us and we think, well, I'll be tolerant, but I'm not going to be nice. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes I have that attitude like, well, just the fact I'm allowing them to be in the same room with me, <laughs> you know? Really, that's honest. Like, I am the bigger one because I'm here. And if they would have came, they would know I'm here. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's what kind of brought me uh, to this whole point that everything about our walk should be authentic, you know? And I don't know about you, but when I don't like someone, they can feel it. They really can. We think we're the bigger one. They really get the vibe that you don't like them very well. And that is not honoring to God. I was so convicted this week by this study in particular just because, well, I wasn't going to share it, but I guess I was. Um, there was just somebody in particular that my husband was doing business with that really, another Christian that really basically looked at him in the face and said, I'm going to wrong you. And I was like, oh, oh. And my husband, God bless him. He's so forgiving, and, and for me, I'm just going to share my weakness. His forgiving, being so forgiving, I think I looked at as a weakness. Mm -hmm. Like, almost as, um, you know, not standing up for himself. He's that forgiving, and God just totally hammered me this week. Like, <clears throat> that's honorable to him. It is commendable before God that we have that forgiving heart. Literally, my husband told him, hey, we're, if, if it's our friendship or this, it'll just be our friendship. And I sat across, I was like, see that? What are, that's not right. <laughs> and, and I was even telling Brenda how wrong it was at, at dinner one night. And God just totally, I'm glad I got to at least study this because God totally hammered me on, no, that's how we're supposed to be. That's honoring to him, submitting to those who wrong us, submitting um, to those in authority above us. That's the perfect example of Christ, full submission. Uh, it says in verse 18, Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. And Peter is speaking specifically to the slaves um, at that time. But I think it's so easy to apply that to our lives right now. Just to be, when it says, um, for those who are, not only for those who are good and considerate, but to those who are harsh. And I think of harsh, when I was thinking of the word harsh, more like, to somebody not that kind, as you know, harsh. No, the word actually means crooked, unscrupulous. And how many times do we show um, with all respect, you know, that attitude to those who are crooked and unscrupulous towards us? I have a very hard time with that. I was, I was totally convicted in this area, and we need to understand that that respect that we show everyone is God honoring. Um, it says in verse 19, For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. He is conscious of God. He is aware of who God is, who his place is, and, and because of that, he's going to bear up under unjust suffering. That's what we're to do, bear up under the unjust suffering. I just think of that pain that Christ went through and, and his willingness to submit. 
know, to the Lord and how I'm not just always that willing. I'll be honest. It says in verse 20, uh, but how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it, but you suffer for doing good and endure it? This is commendable before God. He keeps telling us what's commendable before him. He's also sharing his will for us. It says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his footsteps. Christ is our ultimate example, and we're to follow in his footsteps. It says um, in verse 22, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And the word entrusted is actually translated in the New King James as committed. He committed himself to the one who judges justly. He was fully committed. And that's the last point. Like, are we fully committed to our faith? Do we really believe what we say we believe? And if we do, it's going to show in our actions. I picture, you know, like us all at, at a family dinner and Uncle Joe, like, having too many beers in the corner and getting loud and obnoxious and how easily <coughs> it would be to just write him off and kind of laugh at him and, you know, oh, I would never do that. I'm getting my kids out of here. Like, just that attitude we can have, you know, when we're in a place where people are doing things that are not honoring to God. What do we do in those situations? Do we love on them? And I'm not saying go to bars and love on the people in bars. I think you get the point of what I'm saying. I'm saying in our families, there are unsaved people. We have the next month and a half that we're going to be in those rooms, and they're going to be looking at us. They already have ideas of who we are and what we're going to think of their behavior, and we want to make sure that everything we do is honoring to God, and the point is that we draw them to Christ. That's the point, that they get drawn to the Lord. From, they're not going to get drawn to the Lord when we're condescending and they think we're above them, and they think that we're judging them. You know, that's not how we're going to draw. That, is, that wasn't Christ's attitude. It should never be our attitude. Um, I was studying about being committed to the Lord and all those areas in my life that I need to be more committed. And I want you guys to just really take a walk with where you're at and, and what areas of your life you can commit to. You know, whether it's in service, whether it's in reading the word, whether it's to sharing Christ with your children, your spouse, whatever it is, there are those areas that we all can commit more to the Lord. My son came home from work the other day, and he plopped down on the couch, and he said the most profound, annoying, and frustrating thing. <laughs> he said, Mom, I mean, literally, this is the only thing he said. He said, Mom, if we as Christians were all like the Mormons, the world would be a better place. And I first I looked at him and was like, what? What is wrong with you? And then I thought, exactly, exactly. And, and do you know why that is? It's because they believe that it's their works that gets them salvation. It's their works that will get them to whatever planet they're trying to get to, wherever they're trying to go. It's works-based. And so they're like buzzing along instead of understanding. We have Christ, and how often do we take advantage of what Christ did on the cross for us in the way we live? You know what I'm saying? Like, how often do we just think of it like, oh, yeah, we're safe. You know, he'll forgive us. And it's a shame. You you look at other faiths that, that are workspace like that, and they're, they're at church. Like, people complain that messages are 55 minutes. It's like they're sitting at church on Sundays, the Mormon church, like for three hours, and then they go to Sunday school after, and then they go here, and then they can't go outside. It's like fully committed. And how sad that they're deceived. You know, we have the one true and living God, and are we fully committed to him? I um, I saw this uh, illustration that just made, gave me kind of a picture of, of how we're so foolish at times. It had uh, this man, and he was walking out to garden in his garden, but he said, I'm not a very good gardener. Like, the, the little thing is like, I don't really know how to garden. And he's got this book in his hand, and it's How to Grow Tomatoes. So they have an illustration of him sitting down and showing the book to the tomatoes. <laughs> you know, you picture him like reading it himself, like, okay, so how am I going to go? He's showing the tomatoes like they're going to do something. <laughs> you know, and I pictured that with our lives. Like, how many times we tell people, oh, you need the word, and they're thinking, you need the word. You know what I'm saying? They're thinking, you might want to open that book. And I don't want to be that person, you know? I don't want to be the one that says, here, you need this, and they go, why? What's it doing for you? And it's so important that we understand 
that God's Word is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's our life source. You know, we hear testimonies about what God's doing in the lives of the women in our church and how you see complete transformation. We don't want to ever be in that place in our walks that we're just still growing a bit here and a bit there. We want full transformation. We want to give God all the glory in our walk. And this just seems like such an appropriate time of the year that we're going to be around people that we're not always around. And we're, be, we're going to be able to give God the glory in our walks, in who we are, in how we respond to them, in how we react. I want to have an authentic faith. I want to be the kind of Christian that people say, oh, did you see her? Did you, did you see what God's doing in her life? I want to be that. And there's so many areas we need to abstain from. There's so many things we still need to submit to. We still need to submit to our husbands, ladies. <laughs> we do. I do. I try. Lord, I try. Um, and we need to commit. We need to commit wholeheartedly to the Lord. And that might look like something different for each person in this room. It's going to look something different for wherever you are at in your walk and wherever you are on your road to sanctification. But we shouldn't be the ones dragging it out. You know, God's revealing those things. I've loved study lately because there have been so many things that I was just like, boom, right in my head. You know, had I not been in the study, if I weren't digging into his word, I wouldn't know it. I wouldn't see it. You have to be in it to know it is the pure milk of the word. You know, this is what God wants us to do. He wants us to know him. This is the only way we're going to know him. So I just want to challenge you guys. I want to hear stories when we all get back from break of how, you know, People were dropping like flies at the family parties accepting Christ. No. <laughs> Actually, that would be a good story if we had, if we had a couple of them. Um, so I just want to challenge you, ladies, just be mindful of your walk. Be mindful of who you're coming in contact with. You know, it's just not, you know, I know I'm saying family parties, but it's in your home. You know, it's not just out there for others. It's your daily walk in your home. You know, there are some of, some of you who have unsafe husbands. You know, that gentle and quiet spirit, God has a word for that too. Heavenly Father, I am um, God. Such I'm in such awe of you today, uh, Lord. Just seeing the work that you've done in my sisters' lives and being reminded, God, um, of how amazing you are, how sovereign you are, Lord. How you are willing to just continue to seek us outward, and and just how um, just how sovereign you are. That for me today, Lord, seeing your sovereign hand in in our lives, uh, God, I'm so thankful. Um, you are a gracious God. You are holy, um, Lord, and we are to honor those. And we honor them, um, others, Lord, by loving them the way you've called us to. And I just thank you, God, for your word. I thank you for this time. I thank you for my sisters in Christ, Lord, who meet here each week, Lord, just to, to draw closer to you, Father. And I pray that you would bless them during this break, Lord. I pray that, Lord, you would lead and guide God, and that we wouldn't use this break, Lord, um, to... Uh, Take a time out of your word. But, Lord, we would use this break, Lord, uh, to dig in even deeper to what you have to say to us. And it's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Um, I have a few.